Zen Islands 4, 5 and 7 are recorded by Hansard. Great. Uh, any apologies? Peter Weir, Chair. Okay. Uh, uh, Adrian McQuillan. Okay. We refer members to draft minutes, pages 5 to 10. Members can their record record. Agreed. Uh, refer members to summary table for requests for information from the BAP at pages 12 to 13. Um, and I advise members that following last week's scrutiny of corporate service divisions performance against business plan targets, uh, it may be useful to seek additional information, including financial data on performance uh, by all DFP business areas, in order to inform the committee's forthcoming scrutiny of the draft budget for 15-16. Uh, a draft letter following up on last week's session and a draft pro format is included in tabled papers. Uh, can I seek agreement to forward the letter in pro format to the department for completion by each DFP business area? Right, Chair, the proof, the proof format, just at page eight of table papers, and I need to add a couple of fields just to capture the opening and closing budgets, but I think they've dropped off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, can I remind members also that at last week's meeting the committee agreed the final draft of the committee's inquiry report into flexible work in, in the public sector. Uh, the draft committee motion is at page seven uh, of your table papers. In line with the standard uh, wording mm -hmm. previous. Okay, members contend that submit it to the business committee for scheduling uh, in the week commencing the 10th of November. Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, advise members the printed report will be issued to all MLAs in advance of the debate, but will be embargoed uh, until the start of the debate in preliminary. Uh, also, th th this morning, uh, the terms of reference uh, for the assessment of welfare reform. Uh, the Minister referred to this in question time this week. Uh, we have received correspondence uh, from the Department and this is tabled uh, for members' consideration. Just came in this morning, Chair. It's perhaps something members we can consider in further detail uh, next week, but certainly at this stage we should uh, copy the correspondence to the Committee for Social Development, uh, given the cross-cutting nature uh, of the issue. Yep, yeah, agreed. Yep, agreed. The only thing is, is if we are going to comment on it and push it back to another, it pushes the whole thing back another week, is it not? And there's quite an urgency around this. That, that would be my only concern. Mm. I think the department are going to press ahead. Would I just add to it? For information. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no indication that. No, that the, the departments are waiting yeah. a review of the committee on it. Okay. Do you have any views on it, or? Well, I haven't. I'm ready. We <laughs> 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 just got it as well. Um, so I suppose, I suppose, if we let the department know that we we may come back uh -huh. to them with yeah. additional things. And things Okay, members, moving on to the first evidence session of the day, uh, October Modern Resource Allocation, uh, briefing from the Department. Uh, can I refer members to the Ministerial Statement at Tabled Papers? Uh, I welcome uh, Joanne and Stephen uh, to the committee. We're very welcome this morning. Do you want to perhaps just give us a brief overview of where we are in terms of October Modern, and then we'll go to questions. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the first thing to say is that the Minister's statement on Monday only covered the non-ring fenced resource Dell side of the October monitoring round. The remainder of the monitoring round, the proposed reductions, reallocations and technical adjustments and the capital budget will be addressed in line with the normal monitoring timetable. Um, you probably recall the June monitoring round, the executive agreed to reductions to departmental resource Dell of 2.1 per cent or 77.9 million to fund a number of inescapable pressures across departments. Uh, Education and health were protected in that. The June monitoring paper also advised departments should plan for further reductions of 2.3% in October monitoring, equivalent to the 87 million cost of the non-implementation of welfare reform. Since June, a number of inescapable departmental pressures have been identified, uh, totalling some 125 million. So combined with the 87 million welfare reform cost, the total <coughs> pressure to 212 million. Seeking to address this pressure through further in year deductions this late in the year would have been virtually impossible to manage. And in light of this, the Chancellor of Exchequer granted a temporary access to the reserve of up to 100 million in 1415. This access came with a number of conditions attached. 
including that firm revised equal rent allocations for 14-15 should be agreed. The level of the reserve access required will be deducted for 15-16. Welfare reform costs of 87 million in 14-15 and 114 million in 15-16 will be deducted from the executive's deal. And a credible plan for a balanced 15-16 budget is to be agreed before the end of October this year. At their meeting on the 9th of October, the executive confirmed the proposed level of reductions for which departments were asked to plan in June monitoring. They welcomed the Chancellor's letter and agreed to take up the 100 million access to the reserve. And they agreed to make the following allocations. 8 million to DARD for TV compensation, 13.8 million to DETI for Invest NI and sporting events, 60 million to Health for pressures in the health sector, 29 million to DOJ for PSNI and legal aid, 4.5 million to DRD for concessionary fares, 1.3 to OFMDFM for victim service, 0.8 to the Northern Ireland Assembly to reinstate the June monitoring reduction, and 7.6 million to PPS for equal pay and casework challenges. As a result of this, the Executive has exited the October monitoring round with a £25 million resource to over commitment. So obviously it's going to be imperative that departments live within those revised control totals and make best endeavours to identify any reduced requirements. In terms of the, the, the penalties, uh, which, uh, I mean, the Minister referred to risking the wrath of the Treasury uh, and incurring additional penalties had an agreement not been reached for the £100 million loan. Um, what specifically did Treasury indicate would be the penalties if there was a breach of the deal? The statement fund of funding policy does say that that would be seen as a mismanagement of the budget. Uh, what's laid out in the statement of funding policy is the ability for Treasury to deduct that from our next year's mm. budget allocation. That would happen almost automatically. Um, anything else for that would be within the scope of the Treasury, and they haven't actually indicated what actions they would take, but they could have stepped in to adjust cash amounts in year because the Secretary of State has that facility within the legislation. In terms then of the allocations, um, obviously there's two mostly, or 60 million for health and 29 for DOJ. Uh, and it is quite significant allocations in, in comparison to other uh, modern rounds. Um, and they all are defined as inescapable. How, how do each of the eight uh, allocations how do they fit that <coughs> bill? Because you know, the, the committee would have concerns um, that some uh, some of these bids labelled as inescapable perhaps are not inescapable because departments will do whatever they can to try and get money out of these modernised. Well, you know, at the end, <coughs> sorry, at the end of the day, it was for the executive to decide w which uh, pressures they met. Um, a lot of them are deemed to be either previous executive commitments or inescapable contractual commitments. For example, the TB compensation in, in Dard would be a contractual commitment for them to pay compensations to the farmers. Um, the pressures in the health sector, obviously, you'd be aware that they say they're facing 130 million of a pressure, so that was to help address that. Uh, legally, DOJ have a commitment to pay that, and in case of PPS equal pay, there have actually been a industrial tribunal which has recommended that they make those payments. Um, that's probably the assembly is a reinstatement of their monitoring reduction because they have they had written to the minister and the executive have accepted that we shouldn't be reducing the assembly's budget. Essentially, no. first would be an executive commitment and. Um, in terms of DETI, um, it's contractual commitments made to firms committing to invest in Northern Ireland. Um, so. In addition, on the DETI one, in, two years ago, we reduced the DETI budget on the understanding, due to the downturn in the economy, on the understanding that should there be an upturn in the economy and they needed the funding, the executive would provide that. So it's, it's sort of a, a double, it's an executive commitment mm -hmm. and the legal commitment to the, the companies. And how can we be assured that there will be no further inescapables coming? Uh, and the rest of this financial year? Um, uh, departments have been advised that there will be no further bids considered in the rest of this October monitoring round and that they will be expected to live within this control total. Obviously, we can't at this point in time prejudge what will happen in departments, but the onus will be on the ministers to live within the, the total they have now been given. And given that we're finishing the round with a £25 million over commitment, there's going to be little, if any, scope to meet any future bids. Okay, Judith. Um, just, you know, the, these have been referred to as inescapable um, situations that, you know, that we're in. Just wondering um, how, how much was asked of um, DRD around the concessionary fares, um, given that it would appear that Translink have a £5 million surplus at the moment. Was there any 
questioning done through officials through to the DRD around that. Our officials, on that. Yeah, our officials, sorry, I wouldn't have been party to that myself, but our officials would work quite closely with departments and they would they would have considered that. And um, Translink's reserves, I'm, I'm presuming, are committed to other things other than the concessionary fares, but I couldn't say that definitively at this point in time. Okay. Uh, Ian? Yeah, um, in respect of um, departments who suppose at each modern round some departments have money that they have been unable to spend. Is there any discussions going on with those departments to ensure that at least at the earliest point that they inform the centre that they have, you know, an, an underspend and to ensure that money is allocated. So I presume the conversations happen all the time, but you know, I, I take it there's more of an urgency in those conversations. Yes, there is, an individual, and ministers have been advised that, that their departments should be keeping in close contact with us, and sub colleagues in supply do liaise with departments on an almost daily basis, and all departments and finance directors will have been told that they are to discuss with us at the earliest opportunity any potential underspends, certainly in advance of the January monitoring round, to give a bit of, of pre-warning on that. Those, so, you know, the, the normal process is, if there's any underspend, to DRD, they can spend it in roads. But you know, any of us that have been meeting with even contractors in, in different areas, that's becoming more and more difficult because as they lay men off because of difficulties currently, they're unable to you know commit to ensuring that that's happening. So I think it's more important now that whilst I have my opinion about how that whole process should be rolled out, certainly in respect of, of DRD, uh, but. You know, I think it's not necessarily. Well, there may not be as much money, um, you know, in the January as what maybe it was in previous years. I think, you know, how we do things needs to be, you know, changed quite drastically in, in that sense because it's not going to be just as simple as fired all excess money to DRD because it's you know they're not going to be able to. Well, I'm sure they will, but it's not going to be as easy to. Um, you know, just get men to go out and fix the roads, as it were. Um, so it's, it's something that I think should be, you know, happening. And I suppose it's, it's encouraging to hear that there is a, a more of an urgency in that respect. There is, and, D and DRD would, in their engagement, our officials have made us aware of that as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there's going to be many resources available in January, but mm -hmm. it's certainly something we're aware of. Obviously, on the capital side of things, there will be additional proposals put to the executive next week in terms of reduce requirements and allocations, etc. So uh, that will impact the RD potentially. Okay, that's that. Thanks, Chair. Um, always amused by the inescapable of myself. The um, 1.3 million for the victim services was an inescapable pressure in October. But it wasn't an inescapable pressure in June, was it? Um, I don't have the... Well, it wasn't met in June, so I'm presuming it, it wasn't deemed to be an executive commitment at that time. I don't actually have the June paper with me to see how that was addressed, but I think there was an, uh, an acceptance by the executive <clears throat> that that was an important area to be funded. And as well as being inescapable for contractual or legal reasons, we've also looked at executive commitments and anywhere the executive has agreed that they would provide funding. And I think that falls under that. But it hadn't been put in the budget even. No. It was intended to be dealt with as a bid during the June monitoring. Now, how, you know, clearly it was inescapable in the sense that people were there, people were there, the job was being done, people were employed, but yet it was left out of the initial budget. It's a view to have been dealt with by a monitoring round. Well, that was obviously a decision that was taken back in the original budget. Where's the logic in that? <laughs> well, the pressures emerge um, at all uh, times. Sorry, this is a fixed part of the budget. Should be concluded. Yeah, it should be. Sorry, and I'm not completely over the OFM DFM detail, so I don't know at what point. I mean, the budget was set four years ago, so I don't know if whether that was identified as a pressure at that time or it has emerged since then. So, with a budget that's set four years ago, there is obviously going to be things that come up during that time, which will be dealt with in the, the monitoring rounds. Now, it was unfortunate that it wasn't able to be dealt with in the June round, but the importance of it has been recognised in the October round and the funding provided. But it wasn't in the budget this year. No, it wasn't. In the fourth year budget? Yes, and I'm sorry, I can't it comment. It was left out? Yes, but I can't comment on whether that was raised as a pressure for OFM, DFM at that time. Um, and also, when we were, when the budget 11, 2011 15 was being created, 
ministers at that time would have had an ability to move money between their budgets to fund these pressures, and had they decided at that time it was a pressure, presumably they would have done that. So without knowing the absolute detail of it, all I can presume is that at the time the budget was set four years ago, it wasn't, the pressure wasn't identified, and the first opportunity then... Sorry, this it. is an ongoing budget heading. Yes, and the department... Back and it was and left out this year. When the the plan was to deal with it in June monitoring. Yes, and I, that was obviously the plan. I'm, what I'm saying is I cannot comment on what went on in Budget 2011-15 because I'm not prepared I'm not for that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the current year. Yes, but... I suddenly but, something's number one, not in the budget. Uh, the plan is, oh, we'll deal with it in the June monitoring. The June monitoring came and went, <laughs> and it wasn't dealt with. Right. And then suddenly it's an escape in October. Yes, the reason it wasn't... <clears throat> the budget... I understand you're talking about the 14-15 budget. The opening budget for 14-15 was set back in 2010. I realise all that. I'm only concerned so, with the fourth year of the budget. Yes, which is the fourth year of the budget, so it's set back in 2010. <clears throat> so all I can presume is that at that time, the department had not identified the need for that funding to be in it. But I can't comment definitively on that because I haven't got the details of the budget. Well, can I ask you, maybe you'd have a look at the detail? I can certainly but, have but a detail. Could I ask you, are there any other similar examples where a main budget heading hasn't been included in the budget and was intended loosely to be dealt with in the monitoring round? I can't say definitively that there were or were not. What I would say is that I would imagine departments would endeavour to identify all future budget pressures when the budget is being agreed. Well, it didn't happen here. Well, I, as I say, I can't comment on the detail of that. I'm presuming that it didn't happen here, but the monitoring rounds exist to address those sort of issues. I'd be grateful if you would check that, because I think it's a fundamental change in the attitude, Chair, how budgets are set. As things are left out as main items are suddenly dealt with, well, we'll consider that in the monitoring round. Because we now know that monitoring rounds, there may not be the money there. Yes, that's maybe not always the intention. At times, new, new initiatives come along, post the budget being set, and the only vehicle for those pressures being addressed is through the monitoring round process. Yeah, but the people employed here on an ongoing basis, you know, it was clearly meant to be a, an ongoing situation. Yes, but presumably, as Stephen says, it has emerged since the budget has been set, and that is a matter for the department to identify those pressures and when they're committing to it to allocate funding to that. Yeah, but it hasn't been emerged since it, it was there. It was there last year and it was there the year before. But was it there? Anyway, I appreciate yeah, any I need to check, help. was it there in 2010 and that. what you know, priority the department put in that? Ian made reference there to the DRD budgets, uh, and it is an issue that needs to be dealt with, I think, because DRD uh, or street lighting potholes or whatever, um, it's, a, it's a bad habit, I think, that's been picked up uh, by the department where this money should be in the baseline, uh, but instead it's used to pick up the slack at the end of the financial year. No, but uh, street lights only stopped working. Recently, they, you know, they worked up until then. They only had to be included into monitoring rounds because they never ever broke down before. Uh -huh. Nor did potholes ever <laughs> start to appear. That's a new thing, <laughs> is it? <laughs> but, but the point I'm trying to make is that they've been, uh, and the companies that Ian referred to uh, are in difficulty now um, because this hasn't been part of the baseline. Uh, and they're almost the victim uh, of, of this process now where health and other priorities are coming in. Uh, is the department taking a serious look at that and are they having serious talks with DRD about how those budgets are mainstreamed in future to ensure, because as, I think it's a greater impact uh, on contractors involved in this kind of work because of how the modern lines are currently operated? Um, a certain element of the budget is baselined into the budget settlements, any monitoring round allocations are over and above that, but obviously um, the constructions firms would say that not enough of that is baselined and that's something we can look at with DRD. Mm -hmm. But are you looking at it with DRD? Yes, I mean our supply officers will have engagement with DRD and they, they will pick up on that, but ultimately it's a matter for the department themselves what level of funding they want to allocate that mm. in their baseline. Is that something you could have talked with DRD about and perhaps come back to the committee by way of written correspondence you know, to see how we can move that issue forward? Because I think it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Yes, we can certainly raise that with DRD and come back to you. Obviously, in, in relation to road structural maintenance, um, DRD can be quite reactive when reduced requirements are declared on capital throughout the year. So that, that is part of the explanation for why they seem to get all capital allocations for road structural maintenance mm -hmm. at short notice, whereas other capital schemes have less capacity to spend through the new monitoring process. Also, in terms of depreciation, uh, the Department previously advised the committee that was submitting a bid for £2.3 million for depreciation costs. Uh, since it was unable to contain these within existing baselines. 
What's the likelihood that those costs will become an emerging pressure for other departments during the year? Well, this element of the monitoring round didn't deal with the depreciation pressures. It only dealt with our non-ring fenced resource Dell. It's quite possible that a number of departments will have pressures on the depreciation because that tends to come out in year when they look at their asset base and calculate their depreciation. But that would be something that will be picked up in the next element of the October monitoring round. Mm -hmm. And do you have any indication of what kind of pressure that will be? Unfortunately, not at this stage. And at all, so there's no indications from the departments in terms of. Not that I have with me at the, <laughs> at the moment. Departments will have submitted their bids in the normal October monitoring round, but I don't have that level of detail. But it will be brought before the executive. Yeah, I mean, we have received departmental bids around that, etc. So that will be brought to the executive next week for consideration around in relation to allocations. Okay. Okay, members, any other questions? Happy enough. Okay, Stephen, Joanne, thank you both very much again. Okay, members, moving on to the briefing from uh, NERDA, uh, business reading issues. Uh, I can refer members to pages 16 through to 39 of your packs. I can welcome Glenn Roberts, Chief Executive of NERDA, to the committee. Glenn, you're very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Glenn, do you want to perhaps give us a brief overview of uh, your organisation's thoughts on the Small Business Rate Relief Review and any other points you want to raise with them? Well, Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to brief uh, your committee. Um, I think at the outset it's worth saying that rates is probably uh, one of the, the issues that the Executive has a good, strong track record on. Um, it is the only taxation power that Stormont currently has, uh, and we've seen out-of-the-box thinking in a whole range of aspects of the rating system, uh, not least the empty premises relief, which has now helped create uh, over 331 uh, new businesses from hotels, from the Marine Court Hotel and your own constituency chair, which is a big help to regenerating uh, that part of Ballycastle, uh, to new restaurants, new shops, to many other different types uh, of business. So it is certainly a scheme that we want to see uh, built upon and indeed extended. And of course, the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme, um, which uh, uh, we strenuously lobbied for over quite a, a number of years, uh, has been a help. But I think in one sense, as we face into 2015, we face a almost perfect storm of rates issues with the revaluation, re the rates convergence, the review of the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme, and obviously a fourth area where the Minister has indicated that he wants to uh, instigate a further, further review of the whole rating system. So for our members, 2015 is the rates year. It is the key year for us to make sure we get all of those things right. And obviously with the, the reval, there will be winners and losers in it, but we hope that the revaluation will reset things, and obviously for us, uh, we want to see our town centres and our town centre traders uh, looked after in that review. And obviously for some time we have expressed concern that many of the big out-of-town stores are actually paying less per square foot than many of the town centre traders in each of your constituencies. But just to turn to the uh, current review of the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme. We have uh, both given written and oral evidence to the, the NICEP review, and we have obviously uh, done, I suppose, more of a, a, a sort of brief telephone survey of our members who qualify for it. And within our 1,500 members, we estimate that there's roughly about a third that qualify for it. And we were asking, well, what did you do with the savings? And it varied from buying a new cash register to putting a staff member on a new course to, up, to upgrading the shop to many other different things. So even though for many of them it, it was anywhere between 500 in some cases up to 1,000, uh, although that is a small amount, it was certainly welcome. And it, and it sent a very important message that this institution actually values the contribution our independent retail sector and our small business sector make to the economy. And of course, we never saw it as a silver bullet, but we did see it as something that alongside, for instance, the five hours for a pound car parking scheme, uh, the changes in planning law to get a strong town centre first planning policy, uh, addressing issues like red tape and regulation, all of those things together, and actually it was about government departments doing lots of little things that add up to something big. So I think that in that sense, 
uh, the uh, the operation of the small business utility scheme has has worked well. It's a simple enough scheme to operate. If you are fifteen thousand and below, you qualify for it. I, one of the things in discussions with NICEP and discussions with uh, various other key stakeholders, I, I get the impression that a more targeted approach may well be something that NICEP, I haven't seen the final report, they may look at a, a more targeted approach. But we would be generally happy with uh, the current scheme extended from 15,000 to 17,000. But if that is not on the case, we have put forward uh, a number of different options. I think the first thing is looking at our town centres. We have still the highest shop vacancy rate in the UK. In fact, twice the UK national average, and that figure has stayed stubbornly still for quite some time. Uh, so, what we want to we have, there are evidence that we put to the review is to look at if it were possible to establish a town centre rate relief scheme. And what we mean by that is essentially to ensure that we incentivise further uh, town centre locations for any type of business whether it is new foreign direct investment, uh, whether it is new retailers, new hospitality, to ensure that we get and incentivise our town centres. We have enough vacant land at each of our town and city centres to ensure that that is the case. We have enough dereliction, and I think our new super councils have a big role to play in addressing that with the new powers that they have. Uh, so we would look at uh, certainly a town centre rate relief scheme. We're also very conscious that in a lot of our discussions when we talk about town and city centres, we actually forget the contribution our villages make to uh, our retail sector and to community life as well. Uh, a lot of our members, being very small retailers, are actually, if you like, the mainstay in those villages. And if they weren't there, village life uh, and community life would be the worst for it. We've, um, so we've asked them to look at a rural rate relief scheme in terms of small villages and the, because the, con the vital contribution that, that independent retailers, particularly independent grocery retailers, make in those villages. Um, we've also said that, that given that the large retail levy is the end, um, we think that is a mistake. We potentially would like to see reform to that, whereby the large retailers that do the right thing and locate in the town city centres, that they are exempt from it. Uh, none of the stores, to the best of my knowledge, that paid for the large retail levy have closed. Uh, in fact, they continue to grow and expand. And of course, we already have a precedent in place with the manufacturing rate relief scheme, um, where they, that has been in place and worked very well to support our manufac manufacturing sector. We also need to see, in terms of changes to the empty premises relief, the current scheme where you have to qualify for the empty premises relief, the building or the office or the shop has to be vacant for 12 months. We believe that that should be changed from 12 to 6 months to ensure that we have a faster turnaround, there's greater choice there. And we believe that that policy would insist the work that I hope our 11 super councils will be doing to address town centre dereliction. We also have put forward a, a number of things in that if we get a situation where a town centre falls below, or sorry, a, a town centre vacancy rate reaches 40 per cent, then councils should have the power to request that DFP automatically implements an emergency rate relief scheme uh, to ensure that, uh, that that obviously would be an emergency scheme, but would, would work with that struggling town centre uh, to ensure that they, ha they have the wherewithal to bounce back. And of course, the empty premises relief, aside from uh, addressing the issue of, of dereliction and shop vacancies, is also crucial for uh, new entrepreneurs because the first year of any business is the most vital, vital time. And if you're only paying 50% rates in your first year, then that is a big help. Uh, in terms of the rates revaluation, uh, we do need to ensure that we get as many winners over the line as possible in terms of independent retailers and small business. And there will be winners and there will be losers. And we have been very clear to our members and to the broader business community that there will be people who will not win out in this reval. And so there's always a health warning. But we believe that, uh, that it is timely, it's, it's, it's long overdue, but we hope that it, it will get uh, with our town centres and our independent retail and small business sector first. In terms of the rates convergence, I've been speaking to nearly all of the 11 chief executives. I've been hoping to present to as many of the super councils in the shadow mode as possible in terms of their role. 
Um, and we want to see them playing a greater role in consulting in a structural way with the business community before they strike their own rates. Um, obviously, they are bigger entities. They will be able to do more with the rates they have. So it means that the, the consultation with the, the private sector in terms of who pay the rates, I think, is, is crucially important. We need to see, obviously, the detail of the 30 million fund that the minister has announced. I think he is due in a few months' time to, or a few weeks' time to, announce the detail of that. Uh, and obviously, we want to ensure not just in terms of a one or two year period, but no business is disadvantaged because it moves from one council boundary to another. Uh, and I think that we, so we do need to see. And some of the what I did pick up from the chief executives. Uh, of the 11 councils, whether or not that, that 30 million would stretch to that amount in terms of a, beyond a one or two year period. So I think we need to seek clarification uh, of that, because the worry is that you could get a business that loses out in terms of the rates reval, business that loses out in terms of the rates convergence, and possibly even the small business <coughs> rate scheme if they go for a more targeted approach as well. So in, in all of those things, 2015 is the key year for rates uh, and indeed for our members in that respect. And given that it is the only taxation power, and in one sense, if you look at it this way, that corporation tax is a longer term, uh, it will bring long term benefits to the Northern Ireland economy in terms of FDI. But the rates is the issue here and now that the Assembly needs to deal with. And as I said at the start, and, um, this is something that the executive has a strong track record on. It has thought outside the box. It has done new things, empty premises being reef, which is very different to any other part of the UK and which has now been copied by other administrations. So this is something that um, I think that the executive can rightly say is a success story. There has been a lot done, but there is a lot more to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Glenn. In terms of the small business uh, rates relief, you refer to the fact that there is 1,500 members and about a third qualify. Yes. Um, I suppose an issue for many of the committee members was trying to measure what the benefits of the relief as present are, aside from just the saving for the business. Yeah. Do you have any uh, evidence or an indication in terms of numbers about how it has been re reinvested in terms of IT, in terms of equipment, etc. I, I think we haven't been able to do uh, we haven't been able to do a comprehensive survey because um, obviously that, that that would take time. But what we have done is certainly on an anecdotal basis, and certainly, and I, not just in terms of our members, but also uh, as members know, we work very closely with uh, nearly all of the town-based chambers of commerce, and I've asked the presidents of those chambers to, to feed back in terms of that information. And it's a similar concern out, even outside the, the non sort of independent retailers that, that uh, qualify for this scheme, that they just haven't banked it as such. They have done, even though in grand scheme of things, it is a small amount, but they have used it for things like uh, reinvesting into their shop. They have put staff on courses. Um, and I think it, what it does is, as I said at the start, it's it's not a silver bullet, but alongside things like getting car parking right, getting planning right, getting all of those things right, it, it's lots of little things that add up to something big. And I think that's where we see the benefit of, of the scheme. But for a very small business, saving a thousand pounds is a great deal. Um, and let's not be under. I know some of the, the, the bigger business organ the business the business organisation represent big business have been opposed to this scheme in the past. Um, but you know, when you're talking to a very small shopkeeper, a very small news agent, uh, a very small butcher, saving up to a thousand pounds a year is a big help. Um, and let's not forget, we have the highest—not just the highest shop vacancy rate, but twice the UK national average. And that is something we urgently need to address. In terms of the, the, the town centre rates release scheme, could you perhaps elaborate on that a bit more? Uh, and also, how do you? Define a town centre. Uh, I mean, obviously, I know of a number of examples where uh, people looking at planning applications for a new store in a town might s stretch uh, the definition of a town centre. And also, I heard of another example uh, where um, the development of an out of town store uh, became surrounded by a number of other stores. Uh, and then now they're saying that they're the town centre as to where the original town centre was. Yeah. So how, how do you frame that? Well, I think that, I mean, in planning terms, there are clearly defined town centre boundaries in terms of what is out of town, what is edge of town, and what is town centre. So I think in, in planning terms, there is a definition there. 
Now, I, I know that sometimes when I raise this issue with DFP officials, they get a bit nervous about this because part of the legislation that drafted the Small Business Rate Police Scheme, the large retail levy, was to ensure that as far as possible it was JR free or it was JR proofed. So I do think that this will require uh, some new thinking. And if you were, and I think that, you know, if you look at the o options, uh, I think if, if they were to go down the, the route of looking at a more targeted approach, any investment in a town centre is the biggest multiplier effect. You know, whatever business locates in a town centre, there is an automatic multiplier effect. Whether it's a solicitor's office, whether it's a pub or it's a restaurant, whether it's any of those things, there is an automatic multiplier effect. And that's why we'd like to see hopefully some of the FDI that we will get to corporation tax will go towards our, our, our town centres as well. If you look at some of the big solicitors companies, uh, that Pinsett and Masons, Allen and Overy, are all locating in city cent town and city centres. And that's a big plus, so we want to see more of that. So it actually could be a, a, an important lever uh, in the future. It will require some new thinking, it will require uh, new legislation, but I think you know, this is what you guys are here to do, to think outside the box, not just to say we can't do this. I mean, we were told we would never have a small business rate release scheme by direct rule ministers. It was introduced and extended twice. Um, you know, we did the empty premises relief, which was very different to the rest of the UK. Now it's been copied in all the other devolved institutions. So, you know, this institution has led in rates across the UK. And I think that what we need to do is keep on leading. In, in terms of the, the schemes in existence and the proposed schemes that you've outlined, um, you know, what is the lifespan for these? You know, uh, is there a certain point when the economy recovers that these will no longer uh, be necessary? And also in terms of how you fund them, because is it the case the government here will continue to fund these, or is there other alternatives, such as a large retailer uh, contribution? Well, I mean, it was sort of, when this was introduced, it was referred to as a recessionary measure. We believe that it should be built. It should not be seen just as a recessionary measure. Northern was the only part of the UK at one point that did not have a small business rate release scheme. Those schemes were introduced, you know, well before the current recession. And you have many businesses in many parts of the UK don't even pay rates anymore as a result of successive extensions to the small business rate release scheme there. So we, we don't see it just as a recessionary measure. Yes, it, has it helped during the recession? Of course it has. But we should, I think it would be very, very hard for any finance minister to suddenly pull the plug uh, on a small business rate release scheme with thousands of small businesses paying, suddenly having to pay 20% more rates uh, if this scheme is pulled. I think it would be very, very hard. I don't believe the finance minister, uh, unless I re read him wrongly, wants to end the small business rate release scheme. I think what he's looking at is some new ideas, new thinking of how we build upon it what we got right, what we got wrong. And I think that that's certainly fair enough. But I think in terms of where the funding comes, we'll have to see how the pennies fall out of the rates reval. We'll have to see what comes out of that. And I think that will be, might well be something that we look at in terms of the finance. I'm very conscious of the difficult financial situation uh, that, that, that the executive is in at the minute. But I think we do need to see Obviously, the outcomes of the NICEP review, we need to see the outcomes of the rates reval. And obviously, we need to see how the rates convergence fund uh, operates. So there's, there's three things there that we probably need to see the further detail uh, on what comes out the other end. But I think for us, it's, uh, it's about putting solutions on the table. It's about putting ideas. Some may work, some may not. We produced a very detailed uh, programme for local government ahead of the uh, local government elections there set in 80 ideas, including issues on rates, what we want our new uh, 11 super councils. So they have a big role in this as well. The rates issue doesn't, can't be seen in isolation to what our new super councils will be doing in the future. It has to complement what they're doing. OK, Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I had an occasion last night to be at a Chamber of Trade meeting, so uh, this was very much to the fore at that meeting. Um, one of the things that did come out of that meeting was the current policy which exists in relation to town centres where they've been taken over by what is deemed to be charity shops um, and how prime locations which would be ideal retail locations are now uh, ended up not contributing anything towards the rates uh, and as a consequence some of the traders feel that they were quite wrongly done to on that point. Have you any view in relation to identifying 
possible ways of overcoming that? Well, uh, and I, I speak as a former board member of Oxfam Ireland. I, I one of the what I would say is that the people who are the biggest critics about the growth of charity shops is other charities, um, because in a lot of ways during the recession when people didn't have a lot of money, the growth of these charity shops basically uh, greatly uh, increased. I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, ending or making charging rates on charity shops is, is, is the way to go, because in a lot of areas uh, they're filling very useful gaps in terms of vacant uh, derelict shops. I think they have a, a, certainly a role to play, and certainly a few of them are maybe pushing the boundary in terms of what they sell and how they sell it. So I think that they're, they have a big role to play in our, in our town centres. I think that what we do need to see um, in relation to uh, what our 11 super councils do is actually setting up coordinated uh, uh, vacancy strategies where they're auditing their vacant shops, sitting down and thinking, well, what are we going to do with these empty units? Is it going to be more retail? Could it be something that the community could use? Could it be something that they could talk to another retail chain that they don't have in their town centre? And obviously, given that they can vest empty buildings now, if it's a useful power. But we're very keen that they look at uh, town centre incubator units. And of course, we almost have a good example of that in, in Balamina, uh, in Church Street, where the enterprise company there has established a town centre enterprise hub. And within that there, they have two or three units for very small incubator units for and craft-based retailers. And, and that, what we want to see is, 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 is change the conversation about just seeing these as derelict empty buildings, but I think change it towards saying, well, look, these are the small businesses, the new independent retailers of the future. And what's the executive going to do? What's the super council going to do to help facilitate, create those conditions? And we have set ambitious targets in this report for the councils and the executive to create the conditions for 3,000 new independent retailers by 2020. We've lost about that same as a result of the recession. So we're moving out. The good economic data we've had this morning shows that we're moving in the right direction. So you know, let's be bold. So these are ideas that we will be hopefully wanting to feed into the next programme of government. Now, as far as the revaluation re and that was point that did come out, um, uh, we understand that we have to raise a certain amount of money from rates, um, be that 1.1 billion or whatever. But that's what we have to raise. Yeah. It's how we break that up fairly, and to ensure that we do get a fair break up of that. The, one of the points, and I want to just, I just want to tease out your your, your view of this. Uh, another area that came out that the concern over was that because they are deemed to be town centre, their rate calculation of their value is at a higher square footage rate than what it would be if they were half a mile outside the town. Uh, and as a consequence, they felt that there was no unfairness on that aspect of it from uh, how, how the rates were looking at it. Have you any idea how you could level the playing field in that area? Well, that's top of the list in terms of what we've been saying to the Finance Minister. Um, that has to be looked at. It is inherent unfairness that large multi-billion multi uh, pound multiple superstores pay less per square foot than a small butcher or chemist or grocer. So that has to be top of the list. Um, and that basic unfairness, and I think it's basically as a result, it's been so long since the last reval, and in the last 10 years, you've seen a massive growth in terms of the big UK multiples. We have a, a planning system which is not fit for purpose, which has allowed the growth of massive out-of-town <coughs> retail development to the detriment of our town centres. So, I think that that is top of the list. That has to be addressed, and that's, that is the big thing we will be looking for out of this rates reval. And I have to say, it's what our members and our colleagues in the town-based chambers of commerce will be looking for as well. One, one other, one other message that did come out, and it's, it's probably where we see joined-up government coming in here. Some of them said we would have no difficulty in paying our rates if people could actually find somewhere to park, yep. if they could actually get in, and instead of sitting in traffic jams in our small towns, being an area. So it's something that some of them were saying we don't mind paying rates if we for the customers to actually <laughs> generate the revenue. Well, I, I'm obviously, I'm very conscious in front of the finance committee. I would hope that the, fin the finance minister would uh, support the, re the Minister for Regional Development to continue on the five hours for a pound car parking scheme, which we lobbied for. 
um, which I think has well, been aware, become... you're aware. you're aware that that's now going to become a devolved issue to council. Yes, uh, and one of the reasons why that we, we were very keen on that to go ahead is that it puts down a marker to the 11 councils. I mean, that would be the very least we would expect the 11 councils to do with their off-street car parks when they get them, is to maintain that. Uh, scheme. That's the very least we would expect. Um, obviously, I know your colleagues in the Regional Development Committee are about to launch an inquiry in terms of, of how it is transferred, but it, it's important it is transferred because there's no point giving these councils part over urban regeneration in their town centre if they don't have some control over car parking. And just finally, uh, do you feel that the vacant property uh, rating has had a positive or a negative impact upon our high street. Um, I've had some indications of developers who actually own property in, on high street who have willfully let it get into a form of dereliction to avoid having to pay any rates on it. And as a consequence, even if somebody on the upturn in our market did come about, there's no one to take up the advantage of that opportunity of what is maybe a prime location. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we certainly didn't campaign for the vacant property rate because obviously we have members that do have no. vacant properties themselves. I think what we've seen is an abuse of that, where they tear the roof off or they just level. So you, know, you go into town centres and you see these big gaps. Uh, I mean, Cumber probably is the worst example of that, um, just opposite where the, the super value is, where basically a landlord has just cut the entire building, the roof off, and just its growth of weeds. So I think that probably there needs to be regulations look to tighten that up. But I think that, that, in one sense, whilst there are downsides, that there also, I think, it creates incentives for uh, landlords to fill this empty space, to do deals in terms of rents, <coughs> to fill that in. And obviously, we're seeing more of that. We need to see a lot more of that. But it also meant that, uh, for instance, the empty premises relief, which is a revenue neutral scheme, because it is essentially, you know, the first year is covered anyway by the vacant property rate. Uh, and obviously, if that em if that business that avails of the empty premises relief gets into the second year of trading, then obviously they're paying the full whack, and obviously that means more income for the DFP in terms of rates. But I think that there might be some regulations that we do need to tighten down on the, on the vacant property rate. Uh, but in one sense, it has created more of an incentive for landlords to fill that space. But there, as you say, there has been certainly abuse of that. Thank you very much, okay, Ian. No reason else to ask after, <laughs> after Paul's um, questions, but I suppose I, I wasn't surprised um, to read in your present or your um, paper about the large retailer levy. Um, well, I suppose it's obvious I've been consistent um, about in that sense. Um, I suppose being devil's advocate to some extent, is it just you know? Uh, anti out of town agenda, or is it, you know, fair play? Basically, you know, you've talked about the the square footage, you know, um, issue. You know, is it? You know, there's no point. Um, obviously, the minister has made his um, decision in that sense, and um, I suppose that's up to those that are um, for the retention of it to present that case. Um, but I suppose it's. it's Good, certainly for us as a committee to understand, you know, which I do know your um, opposition to out of town, um, uh, shopping um, centres and whatnot. But, you know, is it that or is it the fair play? Well, it, it, it is fair play. It's, it's not at the out of town, it's pro town centre. Yeah. Um, and we would have much preferred that the large retail levy was exempt from. Excuse me. Those large retailers that do the right thing and locate in town and city centres, where they add to that retail offer and they add to footfall. Um, but I think that in t some of those businesses, and relates to the earlier point that I said to to, to, uh, to Paul, may well find that they are paying more in terms of the outcome of the reval. So they probably haven't escaped in terms of that large retail levy. But I think that what we do need to do, and it's all about levelling the playing field. It's all about ensuring that that we get the future growth of our town and city centres, um, and I think that's where we do need to focus on. And you know, we need to get those dereliction rates down. And that's why that, in a lot of ways, we're very encouraged that the powers that these new councils will have, they could be the change makers in this, and that's what we want to see. But it's all about a level playing field. It is surely a completely unfair that 
the large Tesco's and Asda's and all of those other big multiples pay less per square foot than a small butcher or a small chemist in a town centre. That is unfair and that does need to be addressed and that is the key thing that we will be looking at of this reval. Okay. Um, Paul touched on the, um, those, the, the derelict or vac vacant properties and the charity shops and you know my experience of it in my constituency it's not necessarily the charity shops that are, are complaining um, but I think it's more about getting a balance of yes. you know rather than a, any vacant property to try and save the having to pay rates you yeah, offer it to a charity shop and they start to open up you know, all over the town centre and whilst I have no um, issue with charity shops whatsoever um, and I think certainly as you said they have played an important role in um, the difficult economic times that people at times are unable to afford um, you know, to, to pay the, the high, shop, or high town centre prices and what not but how do we get that playing field and how do we change the the mindset around you know instead of whilst you have the the rates need to be paid and whether it's a vacant property or not how do we get that balance in the sense of that it's not just a charity shop or something of that level opening in, in every street corner? Well I think that every town centre has to have a proper retail development strategy and what we mean, and obviously alongside a comprehensive vacancy strategy. And I think that what we do need to see these new 11 councils is sitting down and thinking through, well, look, after we've done the audit of where is vacant in our town centre or city centre uh, or high street, what are we going to do with this empty space? How are we going to fill it? And, you know, we would take the view, I mean, obviously town centres are not just about retail, they're about hospitality, they're about that vibrant mix. So some of it could be used for arts and culture, some of it we could use for community use. And one of the things that Murray Portis is very clear in her report, the key to successful town centre is getting as many services as possible. Uh, so, I mean, we could look at, you know, more government services going into those areas. Uh, into those vacant uh, buildings. So it's about, I think, all of those things. But also, I'd like to see councils more proactive in engaging with retail chains and, and saying, look, we have this empty unit, this empty store in our town centre. Why don't you come and have a look at this? This might be good for you, rather than leaving it to developers who will do what makes them money. So I think we, we do need to see a big change in, in, all, in, in all of that. Our, our councils have a big role to play. But in terms of charity shops, they're part of that mix, and, I, and a successful town centre has that mix. Um, and I think that for, for us, it's almost moving our town centres onto the idea of being community hubs, about living communities, about coffee culture, about nighttime economy, all of those things. And you know, we've got those some of our thinking in this report. So I, I think that the big concern that we have, I suppose, uh, including this, is that our eleven councils seem to be very process oriented at the minute. And our members are saying to them, well, look, guys, what's the policy here? What are you going to do with these new powers when you get them? How are you going to hit the ground running when it comes to 1st of April to address all of those issues that you raise, Ian? Finally, your, suppose your final point before your conclusion in your paper was about the um, councils consulting with uh, businesses in respect of setting the, the rates and whatnot. Um, I suppose any of us who have been on local government have in the past, if you've ever worked with the um, Chamber of Commerce or indeed you know, worked with local businesses, you know, a lot of them sort of question, well, what do we actually get for um, what we pay in the rate? So I suppose it's, <laughs> I do see some sense in it. Um, I do see the other side of it or the flip side of it where businesses who do question, well, what do we get for our, our rates? Well, you know, if you're entering a discussion with businesses who year on year question mm. what do we get, obviously it's in their interest to have a reduction in the rates rather than any increase in the rates, I suppose anyone whether they live in a, or a business or indeed a domestic. You know, so how do we you know should that be done through chambers of commerce? Um, or do you see you know, obviously it's difficult for a town centre manager to knock every 
um, business owner or shop owner to say, you know, what what um, what's your view? So, how do you see that process working? Well, I, I think first and foremost, the, you know, uh, the Chamber of Commerce is, is is should be the sort of vehicle that that addresses that consultation. Um, obviously, we have a very as as, as all of the members, your, your committee members, know, chair. Obviously. In terms of the chambers of commerce network, it tends to be very patchy. You have some very active chambers. You have other chambers that are barely functioning. In fact, you've whole you've areas like Armagh that don't even have a, a uh, as far as I know, don't even have a chamber of commerce. So uh, hopefully that will change. But I mean, what I would say is that yes, the chambers have a key role in this, and we address this in the report. And I think at times we undervalue the contribution that the town and city-based chambers make because, by and large, they're all volunteers. Um, they're not all retailers, but the majority of them are small business. They uh, are all, you know, they have a, a difficult job to do running their business and running their chamber. And I think that we we don't value them enough. But I think they will have an important role. Um, but I, I do think there needs to be a dialogue there before council strike rates in terms of uh, how they, what rate they're going to strike. But in fairness, it has been gratifying to note that the current 26 have been so sort of tripping over themselves who can get to a zero rate uh, in terms of increase. In fact, some have a minus uh, rate. Uh, so, I mean, that's great. Um, and I think it's, it's fair play that certainly the regional rate has been frozen in real terms. Um, and maybe in terms of this wider review, in terms of rating policy, we can look again at something which uh, w what works. I mean, how, we don't know how the 11 councils will work, what further powers they will get in the future. What's the whole future of the regional rate? Um, I mean, that's the regional rate in one sense is throw back to the old days of Stormont. Um, so uh, let's. I think that the minister's announcement of a fundamental review of the rating system is timely, and I think we need to explore and maybe look. Think out, again that awful term. Think outside the box. There's a lot of international good practice there. Um, let's see what. Let, let's let's see the the the, uh, the what what this review actually says and what it wants to achieve. Thank you. Okay, Leslie. Thanks, Chair. Two points, Glenn, I'd just like to explore with you. You did mention there um, a little of the actual shopping mix. Uh, it doesn't really feature in your report, but surely that's one of our major problems. The damage that was done by poor planning over the years, which allowed, for example, in my own town, uh, of estate agents, uh, banks, building societies, all what I would call non-retail use, has actually killed the shopping mix and therefore reduce the footfall. So surely one of the things we'll have to do is to try to get a change in planning policy. Well, there may even be some sort of priority to encourage specific types of business back in there. Mm. Have you thought about that in any way? Well, that's why we put forward the idea, obviously in our local first report, about uh, the creation of retail incubator units, where councils take over derelict, uh, derelict shops, derelict stores, and, and set up effective little enterprise units for, for new start retailers where if you look at the enterprise centre model, which uh, nearly all of you have in your constituencies, it's taking that model and applying it to a town centre. And you know, Ballymena Enterprise Centre with Ballymena Chamber have done exactly that in Church Street. Um, I got a tour of it done so long ago. I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's just been opened. So there's, that's the sort of thing that you can do in terms of, of getting that next generation of retail entrepreneurs. That, that's been done, as you know, in Bangor, but yeah. it's a slow process. It, and it, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a quick, you know, I'm, you know, obviously, as you know, well aware of the, the, the challenges that Bangor Town Centre faces. But what I would say is that um, having, if you like, estate agents and banks is better than empty shops. Um, and I think the real problem there has been the, the, the huge growth of out of time, but it's also been a lack of a joint up approach. When you have, for instance, DRD doing transport and car parking, you have DOE doing planning, you have DSD doing the core regeneration stuff, DFP doing rates. Quite a lot of the time, we're working across four different departments to get things done, and you know, it, that's not the easiest thing to do. So, in one sense, a lot of those powers are transferring to the new councils. So, in terms of off-street car parking, planning, regeneration, it won't be scuttling across three departments. It will be talking to the relevant committee chair or the relevant officer within council. So, in that sense, I would hope that the new council structure will make it easier to get things done. Uh, and that's why, in one sense, that our focus will be slightly away from 
this august institution more towards the 11 and what their policy agenda is and that's the big gap in terms of the 11 super councils is policy what are they going to do with these new powers and that's what uh, that's that's the big question um, and i think because they're very focused on getting the committee structure right and all the rest are, which is important but what are they going to do in policy terms they don't do strategy very well do we but you do mention the local enterprise agency mm. do you not think that they have become in most cases simply landlords they've lost that initial drive and they certainly don't have turnover in the businesses which was anticipated in the beginning I, I, I'm not. For, I mean, obviously, we, we don't represent enterprise centres. We very few <coughs> actually are in enterprise centres because they don't tend to be uh, retail as such. But what I would say is that the councils with the vesting powers could take over and convert derelict shops, derelict units, in the same way that's been done in Balamina and, and uh, by the, the enterprise company there, um, and ensure that we get that next generation of, of entrepreneurs. We create the conditions there. We work with FE colleges to ensure the skill set is there. So I think, and, and you know, we, we don't just look at, as I said earlier, that all these derel this dereliction that we see in our town centres. Potentially, that could be. We need to see them as the new businesses of tomorrow, the new, not just the new independent retailers of, of tomorrow, but the new restaurants of tomorrow. Um, I look at where members are familiar that our office is based in Valley Hackamore. Um, I mean, Valley Hackamore, three or four years ago, had a vacancy rate of 25%. Now it is a virtual 0% vacancy rate. Why? Because traders got together and formed um, the trade, and obviously one of your members has helped contribute to that, uh, that figure of 0% as well. But one of the reasons, because they had a strong traders group work together in terms of not just retail, but hospitality, churches, community, all of that, and they have turned Ballyhackamore into a self-help organisation. Well, I think the key thing in all of this is having that strong network of traders groups, chamber of commerce, and that's why we have been doing our level best to try and support those chambers. Uh, it, you know, because a lot of them don't get a lot of help; they are volunteers. But where traders work together, where they have. Uh, an approach where they're bringing solutions to councils, to politicians, then we see real results. And I think because too many of them, and, and you know, I've seen this over 14 years of working for the FSB and working for NERDA, uh, my guys are world-class complainers, but they're not too good at bringing solutions. And that's where I hope that is a representative organisation can be seen as an organisation that is bringing solutions and ideas. Wayne work, may not, but at least we're putting forward ideas. And I think that's where we need to, we need to see uh, more support to those uh, town-based chambers. And of course, they themselves will be in the front line in terms of change for their members when these new 11 councils take power. OK, um, then the last point I'd just like to ask you. You do make a comment here about the large retailer levy that um, no significant impact on them because of um, the business rate relief scheme. Have you any evidence to support that? Well, I'm not, unless too much was taken, if any of those stores under that scheme have closed. Um, we're still seeing the continual growth of the main uh, multiple grocery retailers. Uh, so th there's no, th they, although they, they complain bitterly about it, it hasn't, uh, we haven't seen many, if any of them, close. Um, well, obviously, you know, we wanted it to be a lot fairer in terms of the uh, those multiple retailers that do locate in our town centres. That's where we want them to be, um, because that's where they can have the most benefit. That's where they help retail. That's where they help football. Um, so, but obviously that was uh, that was not to be. But again, we'd like this if to be revisited. Um, it may well be revisited in terms of the outcome of the reval that they, and I hope that that it certainly is, because it gets back to that need for a level playing field. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, morning, Glenn, and thanks very much for the presentation. Um, some of the, the points have already been covered. I just want to ask you about uh, the rural uh, relief, r rural rates relief scheme. Mm. Um, would that uh, generally uh, reflect the uh, existing small business scheme, or would it be in any way adjusted or tailored? Well, I think it would. What we're doing is essentially putting a, a marker down on this because I mean I, I be the first to admit that we're, we've been very preoccupied with town and cities, and we forget about our villages. And obviously, you know, village development is, unless I'm mistaken, a responsibility of, of the ARG, so it makes it even more complicated. There's a fifth government department. 
So I think that what we wanted, certainly NYSEP and the DFP to look at is, is, is how they do that, because the those independent retailers in those villages are the community hub. I mean, our members see themselves as community entrepreneurs. They see themselves as providing as much a community service. And when one of those closes, it is an impact, certainly in rural areas, far more than it has in an urban area. Um, and I think it's how do we protect and enhance uh, those village village centres and the community hubs, which our members are. Uh, and I think that what we've got, because we, we and I think this is something that um, as we approach the two elections next year, we'll be developing new ideas about how we get village development right. And I think that's been a gap in our thinking that we haven't developed. So it was really about putting a marker down there to see how we can not just get town and city centre development right, but village development right as well. And I think that that is also something, again, we've, when I've been talking to, uh, because quite, to, to the new eleven councils, that quite often uh, th there's no strategy there to deal with the villages. Um, a lot of the villages don't have traders groups as such, um, because they've only small clusters of traders there. So at terms their voice is left out of both um, council and indeed up here. And we've got to look at ways in which we make sure that voice is there. I mean, one of the things that brought home to me was obviously the ATM robberies, which sadly have come back to haunt us again. But, you know, when an ATM machine, uh, you know, is, is closed or removed, that is, a big, that is a big impact, particularly in rural areas, uh, both in terms of inconvenience to the community and, of course, where people spend. Uh, so I think we've, we've got to look at it. And obviously, we've also got the bank closure programme as well. Um, which, uh, in one sense, you could understand with the growth of online, but that again has an impact as well. Um, particularly again in, 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 in rural areas, and you have all the banks in your own constituencies that have closed in recent years. So that that is, a, is, a, is another impact. But I think what we want to do with it, in conclusion, is to put our is to maybe start a wider debate and a wider focus on how we develop our villages and the retail potential in our villages. Because it is a different proposition to towns and cities. Okay. Um, one of the biggest threats, I suppose, to the town centres, villages, all of the retailers is online shopping. Mm. Um, I know it's not directly related to the, the rates issue, well, it certainly is indirectly. Mm. Um, do you have any... Um, I mean, it's not something, obviously, that you can stop or in any way, but... Um, have you any um, have you any um, strategies for uh, ensuring that uh, town centre trainer, traders can gain as much as possible from that themselves? Well, I think that we've again. I think there has been a big change in our members how they view online. They, they used to th view it as a threat. Now, many of them see it as an opportunity. And you know, we, we talk in our report about the need to develop the, the digital high street. And the digital high street is essentially existing retail businesses uh, still having well-run shops, but also maybe doing 20, 30% of online sales, uh, using social media to better market what they do. And there's lots of really good examples, certainly on, on Twitter, about how they, they, they can market their products. Mm -hmm. I think as well is that we also have set targets for things like every town centre having its own promotional app. Uh, Mara Felt is the first town centre in Northern to have uh, an app which uh, it, 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 you know, is not just in terms of retail, but also bus timetables, cinema times, all of that. So I think that more that we can see town centres doing things like that, uh, things like free Wi-Fi, uh, you know, the next generation of broadband, yeah. uh, all of that there. So I think that there has been a, a sea change in thinking in terms of independent retailers uh, using online. So I think it's about seeing uh, online as an opportunity, not as a threat. Obviously, the, the, the Amazons of this world will always be there. We're seeing, obviously, the big multiples doing more and more home deliveries. But what we've got to try and do is create if you like, a next generation town centre, which has mixed shopping fun, which makes it something that people look forward to go and will go again. There ain't nothing fun about pushing a trolley around Tesco, but there's something fun about a vibrant town centre, which is a good mix of retail, of hospitality, uh, of, 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 that has a real buzz. And I think what we need to do is put the social into shopping. If we can create those incentives, then I think that that will maybe counter, uh, to some degree, the big <clears throat> online threat. But you know, online is here, 
Um, it's not a case of our members of saying stop the world and let me off. What they've got to do is, is embrace that ag agenda themselves, and I think many of them have. And you know, and I think what we need to see is is obviously the, the concept of digital high street uh, being implemented by the new councils. But of course, you know, in a very short space of time, we will be not using money. We will be using the apps on our phone already as a PayPal app. So that's the direction of travel, and our guys need to be part of that. Um, yeah, I, I do uh, notice that uh, many of the companies are using the social media and so on to, pr uh, to promote their business and their, their products and so on and so forth. Have you any um, indication of the extent to which um, local retailers uh, are doing uh, business online? You said about 30 per cent, is that? Yeah, well, uh, what we're saying is that we're, we've certainly uh, uh, case studies whereby you, know, you have an established retailer that is obviously a well-established shop, but is doing maybe 20 per cent, 30 per cent of their sales online. Um, uh, and obviously there are some retailers that, that maybe can't necessarily sell online, but they can market online. Um, and I think that we're seeing in both of those there and a big growth. We're also seeing changes in shopping patterns in that there is less. The days of the big weekly and fort, fortnightly shop are in decline. People are now shopping for two or three days at a time. And again, that opens up again a lot of a lot of opportunities for independent retailers to position themselves ahead of that curve. But I think that uh, you know if they can't sell online, they can certainly market online. Mm. Um, they can you know, and that's why we have said every independent retailer has to be an expert in social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. And increasingly, Twitter is the way that. Um, you see butchers that are marketing, tweeting all the time when they've got a new brand of sausage. I mean, that's that's what they should continue to. That's where you know people live on their mobiles. Now, our mobiles are not just phones; they are mobile computers, and people will buy and sell and do more of their daily life on la on on their mobile phone, not necessarily their laptop. But and that's where our guys need to position themselves ahead of that curve. And is, do you think is there enough uh, support? You know. Um, People are always not that au fait with the, the trends and the technology and so on. Mm. Is there enough support out there to uh, ensure that they get in on the act? Well, something we've had a dialogue with Invest Northern Ireland about, about um, because obviously they're working with lots of businesses in terms of their marketing strategy. So it's something that Invest uh, is looking at. Uh, obviously, the start a business program transfers from Invest to the 11 councils, so they themselves can actually. Uh, can actually contribute to that agenda, and of course, um, the relationship they have with their local FE college uh, is critical as well, because they need to be ensuring they are putting on the relevant courses, not just for the owner manager, but you know for mm. staff as well. So I think that the relationship between our local business and their FE college is key, because they've got to drive the courses and the skill set that the local college puts on, and obviously online training, and a lot of colleges do provide that. Uh, you know, uh, the reality is that the only constant in retail is change. If retailers don't change and adapt and look at new ways to reach customers and markets, then quite simply, they're not going to exist anymore. It, no one owes our members a living. They've got to change and adapt, and if they don't, then they're. And I, quite often, people say, in my job, all, all it's, it's all about looking to the past, the corner shop. No, it isn't. It's about looking to the future. Um, and it's about 21st century retailing and 21st century town centres, which is constantly evolving. It is a constant process of change and innovation. And it, it, that's, that's where it's at in terms of our members keeping pace of that change. OK, thanks very much. Just, sure. just to follow on a couple of Dominic's points, I mean, I would be concerned that small retailers, independent retailers, aren't really in the running when it comes to online uh, shopping, and I think that's uh, that's the elephant in the room when it comes to all of this. And also, I mean, I think when people are looking by furniture, um, big uh, purchases, mm. three, four, five hundred pounds, increasingly what they're doing now is going on to Gumtree or some Facebook pages for Balamina or Colerain, where they're actually shopping between themselves as opposed to going into the town centre or even going into some of the, the larger retailers. So is, is that a concern as well? Is that with the economic downturn, people are looking for cheaper alternatives and buying and, and selling between themselves? 
is another market that's opened up. Well, I, I mean, obviously, there's not a lot ultimately we can do about Gumtree and, and things like that. But you know, I think what it is is ensuring, and we've a, and don't get me wrong, Chair, we have a lot, we have a, we have a long way to go to getting our members, and a lot of, to get that change there. We're only at the start of that. We're moving in the right directions, but it's constantly putting that message is to ensure that they use online, that they use social media. Um, uh, but you know, ultimately, you know, and, and it's keeping pace of where consumers are as well. And you know, if consumers want to buy and sell on Gumtree or any of the other online sites, then there's not ultimately that they can do. But you know, it is ensuring that those independent furniture shops that are left, to use the example, you know, are online. They are using social media. They are getting out there and talking to consumers. Um, so that's a, it's a, and I don't underestimate the task. It is a big task to get independent retailers use that. Of course, not all independent retailers can sell online, but as I said to Dominic there, they can certainly market online. And it does it costs zero to be on Twitter. And I think that that's why we're saying every independent retailer needs to be an expert on social media and they need to be ensuring their products and their services, all of that is out there. And I think that's where, you know, things like app technology, um, and why we have set targets for every town centre to have its own promotional app to ensure that digital hi the concept of digital high street is there to ensure that it's free Wi-Fi. Increasingly now, you know, cafes and restaurants will lose out if they don't have free Wi-Fi. You know, because people sit there with their iPad and over a coffee, and quite often people are doing stuff, buying stuff on their iPad at the same time. It's, it's, it's about all of those things. We're making progress certainly in things like Wi-Fi, but again. Technological change is is it's just a hell of a job keeping up with that. With because I think increasingly in two or three years' time, we'll not be carrying around wallets, or even credit cards or debit cards. It will be the app on our phone, and PayPal already have that app there, um, and it will be just scanning that or finger the fingerprint technology. So that that's where we'll be, and I think that. Um, uh, and, and I think if we can get that change in, in that radical new vision of town centres where you have places that are fun, that you want to revisit, that it's shopping, and I think for what it is about putting social into shopping, about ensuring that, uh, that town centres are fun places as opposed to pushing a big trolley around a very crowded supermarket. And if you look at there that in one sense the retail trend is moving toward independence rather than multiples in some degree because that's why you'll see Tesco building smaller format stores now um, as opposed to the big boxes because they see the way shopping trends are going and I think that's uh, and that's every good retailer will ha worth their salt will spot where the trend is going. But in terms of uh, is it a question of risk? I mean, uh, if a small, medium-sized retailer wants to set up an online presence to sell or even some form of click and cl collect, mm. you know, what kind of investment is involved? And in those is a no-brainer no for a lar larger organisation with larger profits. Um, but is it the, the fact that they'll have to invest so much time uh, and money uh, that they don't, they don't want to take that risk, given that their overheads are already stretched? And is there a, a, a question of how government can look at that problem yeah. to solve it. it. It is. I think that that's a very fair point, Chair. I think because you know, if you have, if you have a shop, you have only three or four employees, you're you're burdened down with red tape and paperwork. Uh, you're doing all that. You have no HR department, um, so you're doing everything. Your your the owner managers doing everything themselves. So and then having to do the online stuff as well. So there is a big challenge there, and and I think that we don't underestimate that. I, I do think probably this does lie again, not to pass all the stuff onto the super councils, but they themselves working with, for instance, the, and the most important relationship I think that uh, these new 11 councils need to cultivate is with their local FE college, uh, uh, and uh, as well as their chamber of commerce, so they themselves can put the relevant courses there uh, in place to train owner managers to train staff as best they can, but it's 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 a, it's a big task and it's a lot of change. I mean, in one sense, the biggest change that we need to see is in the mindset of our members. It's not legislative or policy change. It's the mindset of our members to 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 make that that leap. Uh, but I think that our FE colleges and the good thing about our six colleges is that they are very proactive in listening, adapting, and changing to what local business wants. I'm a governor of the Southeastern Regional College. I see that in terms of the courses that, that CERT provide. 
uh, because they're constantly adapting and listening to what local business, particularly local small business, wants. But you know, I, I've heard of other courses that have been sort of set up in terms of social media that have a very poor attendance. So you know, at times, independent retailers can be their own worst enemy if they don't listen, they don't adapt, they don't change, and they don't avail of these things. So. We have an education process and to drive that change ourselves, um, but I think that um, we're getting there. But it's it's a, you know, it is it is is uphill, but we're going in the right direction. Kayla. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Glenn. Uh, apologies, I missed the beginning of your presentation. It's never easy getting from Stravandi Valley Golly. <laughs> um, Glenn, uh, I suppose most, a lot of my questions have been asked, and the deputy chairperson raised the issue around the rural retail rate relief scheme and what you would envisage that would look like and would it look something similar to the town centre, 25% reduction. Um, but I suppose it's a mix. I don't really have a question as opposed to making an observation and, and you've just alluded to it um, in terms of the issues that village um, retailers uh, find themselves uh, in at the minute and I think it's all part of the mixture of rates and um, I suppose technology and, and that and, and the, the competitiveness of the market now in terms of um, internet um, shopping and all the rest. But um, obviously you know the area that I represent and um, we do uh, have our own issues in Straban that you're well aware of, Glenn. Um, but just in terms of the rural aspect of, 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 of um, village life in terms of businesses within a village, um, obviously, the demise of, of that has to do with many reasons. I mean, and we do still, thankfully, have a lot of businesses like veterinary services and, and agriculture and, and green grocers and butchers in our, in our village, our villages right across the north. But you're, you're well aware of the issues that they're facing, and rates being one of them. But um, you know, in, in terms of rural broadband, which is a big, massive issue in my area. Um, it's very difficult for people to to um, train up and get their mindsets changed because they haven't got the infrastructure within that area. So there's a massive gap there uh, uh, in the areas that I would represent. But you, you, you did speak about the, bus the assistance, I suppose, and the help that's out there now through councils and through chambers and assisting uh, retailers with um, getting to know what's out there in the world of, of media and the likes of Facebook and, and Twitter and all of that there. And uh, I know my own council area did do um, a, a piece of information and a programme for uh, retailers. But how do you get, how do you change the mindset of the man who's owned the agriculture shop um, in the village? Uh, and it's been in his family business for generations and generations, and his his sons and daughters now have grown up and gone to college and work elsewhere, and he's trying to maintain a business in that village, you know, but doesn't have the infrastructure around him to do that. So how do you maintain that? Well, I think it, uh, I think infrastructure, obviously, rural infrastructure, it, it is key to that. There, you know, where obviously, you know, not often served by regular bus routes, there's very little in the way of trains, mm -hmm. roads need obviously up upgrading. So it's it's part of a, a, a wider picture. But I think really what we are trying, and this is maybe going to a wider question we will be looking at as an organisation, how do we actually get effective village regeneration? Um, and it's a much, it, in, in one sense, you know, DART is a key play on that. Uh, but I think at times that a lot of those villages, as I said earlier, don't have their own traders group. So it's very much there. Not involved in chambers, yes. or uh, some of the, the the bulk of the chambers that we have, for instance, are town city centre based, um, and they 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 don't tend to take in some of the the, the smaller towns. So uh, I think what we've got to ensure is how do we get the voice of those retailers there? How do we ensure things like ATM provision is maintained? Uh, how do we ensure that you know we that we can maintain those? that local butcher or the, the, the local grocer, which is so important, uh, not just in terms of local local economy and jobs, but also the local community as well. So I think it's about looking at, 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 at all of those things. But really what we wanted to do is put a marker down on this. Um, and it's, it's much a marker for us and I suppose the document, our own programme for government that we hope to be preparing in advance of the 
2016 Assembly election. <coughs> uh, and this will be an area that we'll be looking at. So we'll, we will be developing new ideas and we will be listening to our, our, our members because I think the views of our members on this in those villages uh, is key. So it's really an area that we, we, we maybe have been guilty of not doing uh, as much as we should have, but certainly we will be hopefully uh, bringing a lot more ideas in that there. But I think at the very least it would be interesting to see uh, I think we'd be very keen to see certainly this year if rates addressed in the short term in terms of, because given the important community role that our members play in villages in particular, rates is something that at the very least that we could look at a similar scheme as we have put forward uh, in terms of town centres. Of course, it may be that, um, that the, the outcome of this review in small business rates scheme is not a target approach that may be they continue on as they are. Um, uh, with a, maybe a site extension, so w we have a lot more detail to get across. And once we get that detail, then you know, very happy to come back to you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. I think the message I was trying to make is that it is a massive issue, the rates, yes, to to towns and villages, but there's a wider issue as well in terms of infrastructure uh, and, uh, <clears throat> I suppose, changing the mindsets of, of of businesses as well. Thanks, Chair. Okay, okay members. Glenn, thanks very much again. Sure, thank you very much. Members, moving on to uh, the next item, the reform of property management project, briefing from the department. Uh, I'm just going to exchange this with the research session, as the officer here. Uh, just, just before moving on, on yeah. that, it's just, just on that one point, and it's something that I think we need to look at. Uh, great emphasis was made upon what is happening on the internet. I know at least four retailers who have actually closed down from the high street. Uh -huh. They're actually now operating from their own garage and selling over the internet and paying nothing to the rates other than their ordinary domestic rates. And I'm saying it's an area that is totally unregulated, and yet their turnover is probably more than what they were on the high street, and we're, we're not availing of commercial rate. Of that on that area, and it's something that I'm not sure that we can. But it's it's something that needs to be discussed, and I think it's something that the department should be looking at, and it's something I think we should be passing through to the department. That there are a number of online businesses which were on the high street previously, who actually have decided, well, I'm selling more on the internet. I don't need a high street yeah. presence, and therefore they're reducing reducing their overheads dramatically. Mm -hmm. But they're also not contributing anything back in relation to commercial rate. Okay. Can you follow up in correspondence to the department? Yeah. Okay, members. Moving on then. Um, briefing from the department on the reform of the property management project. I refer you to pages 42 to 48. Uh, and can I welcome Paul Wiggins and uh, Jim McCreesh um, from the department? Good morning. Good morning. You want to give us a brief overview? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, as you know, in June 2013, the executive approved the first region-wide asset management strategy, which had been developed by the Strategic Investment Board. One of the strands of work in the strategy is about centralising the management of office accommodation by transferring the office properties and management responsibility from departments and their arms length bodies into a shared service. This shared service will sit within an expanded DFP properties division within uh, Enterprise Shared Services. This work on centralisation is referred to as the Reform of Property Management or our RPM project. And within the RPM project, there are three main strands of work. Um, the first strand is about office estate transfer, and this involves the preparatory work required to ensure the successful transfer of office accommodation to DFP Properties Division. This includes putting together a comprehensive database of office estate information, identifying and resolving procedural, legal and budgetary issues, and getting agreement on the phasing of transfers. The second strand is about surplus asset transfer. This will involve the preparatory work needed to successfully transfer all surplus land and assets to the newly established unit within Properties Division. And this includes compiling a database of surplus asset information, the agreement of asset transfers and a disposal programme uh, for 2016 forwards. And the third strand of work focuses on preparing Properties Division to undertake the new and additional work in relation to property management and asset disposal. 
We now have a project director and have appointed an office transfer project manager who will start in the new year. We've been working with CPD to obtain external contractors to carry out the technical and due diligence survey work. Some of this work has already been procured under an existing CPD framework. We're hoping to get other contractors started work in late October or early November, and this work is due to complete by the end of March 2015. Over the next few months, we'll be developing a draft work programme plan for the delivery of the RPM project, which will identify short, medium and long-term plans for each of the work strands of the project. I hope this explains the background sufficiently. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Further to the references to the compilation of a comprehensive database uh, of office accommodation and surplus assets, which is in page uh, 43 of, of members' packs. I mean, as far back as 2011, the Finance Committee called for a central register of all the public sector property here. Has, has that ever been done, or does that exist? This is well. There, there's a register of EPIMS which we use to collect all the property information, and not all the properties across the wider mm -hmm. central government estate are on that. So this is about pulling all of that information together. On it. If, if you recall, there was the asset management strategy, and then the what's called the softy, the state of the estate report, which was produced in 2012. And one of the recommendations from that was to go and uh, do further work on it. We've only just got the team in place now, effectively building the full details of that. And then the next stage beyond that is to get the condition surveys done on all of those buildings. When will that be in place? Well, then just to go back and finish off what Paul was saying about the, um, the information that is held on EPIMS, uh -huh. is a very high level information about the building, the, the survey reports that are being uh, progressed at the moment. Uh, provide a lot more detail about the uh, the condition of the report, or so the condition of the buildings. Mm -hmm. I think the, the the question on when should it be completed, um, I if I recall it, but it's 2016. Yes, the I, 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 we can double check and come back to you on that one. If you and how extensive is the scope of the project in terms of the range of arms length bodies to be included? Well, the idea is to take all the arms length bodies. I mean, there are up to potentially 120 different bodies that were identified in the state of the estate report and the asset management strategy, which could be undertaking the, the management and disposal of assets. So um, it, it's basically going to, to all of those ALBs. The intention would be to, to bring them all on board and they'll be considered on a, 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 each one on its own basis. There may be some reasons why they cannot come into the, the, the wider estate. See, in terms of page 47, just for members' reference, um, as of 31st of March of this year, there's 15,500 metres squared uh, vacancies uh, throughout the estate, and that represents 3% of the estate, and a comparison was made <coughs> by the Department of England uh, of 2.5%. I mean, is that a good uh, uh, what's the word, result in terms of uh, a vacancy? Is that a good vacancy rate? Or could we do much better? Or as as England been put in there because it's quite similar. Well, we trying to get a, a sense of how well you're doing or not. Well, we, we, we think we've got um, quite a bit of room for improvement. I mean, if if you look at where we were in 2012, effectively what we had were the equivalent of 1.2 workstations per member of staff, mm -hmm. which is you know 20% over capacity at, at its simplest level. Um, the new proposals to take those forward are to reduce them to having eight workstations to ten members of staff. So there's there's quite a bit of room for improvement in that. So I mean, reduced by three percent in the and you know in that state in that period of time. Yeah, I think there's there's much more room for improvement. And obviously, as well, the committee is finishing off uh, a body of work in regard to flexible working, working from home. Uh, working at, uh, at, at I can't even remember the name of it now, um, satellite. satellite stations, satellite offices. Um, so there's a number of options there that we've certainly picked up that there's a degree of resistance within the department. How is this going to dovetail uh, into, uh, into this here? Uh, and is flexible working uh, part of the solution? Uh, because I think, and other members may have different views, the flexible work and could realise significant savings in terms of the public sector, uh, and uh, in particular in terms of the estate. Well, I mean, the committee has been conducting a, an inquiry into flexible working. And if you recall, we had a visit with, from the committee to Clare House, 
Mm -hmm. It must be well over a year ago now. And um, we, we... Nobody there, I remember. <laughs> it's full. It's full now. We've, we've absolutely crammed the building, Phil. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we think we presented at that stage that we have a number of policies that do actually support flexible working, um, and it, it, you know we, we continue to provide the the accommodation that's very much in line with that. So, I mean, a number of our buildings, as we move them towards what we call the new workplace NI standard, the idea is to have some hot desking capability with them. So my, my own building, Goodwood House, for example, has a small number of desks available for, for people who are you know, coming from the estate down to work in the centre of town, for example. Obviously, you can go much wider uh, afield than that. But we, we certainly don't get a sense that this is being rolled out with any great leadership or urgency. And whilst there is good examples within the public sector, uh, within the Department of Finance personnel, um, you know, those are good examples have been there for a year or two now, and they're not been rolled out elsewhere. So, why is there a sticking point here? With regards to providing flexible working capabilities or pushing office estate out wider than Belfast, I'm not, I'm not sure what. In terms of the policy uh, overall, because there is that resistance we did have, I think it was the former uh, permanent secretary here, and um, but definitely picked up uh, in terms of his contribution that there was a reluctance uh, on behalf of the department. Um, well, again, all I can reiterate is that we, we do we believe we've got policies in place to support whatever departments require of that. So, you know, as we get the demands for that, we we continue to try to support that. But do you believe it's enough? In terms of the policy, well, I think the policies are adequate for what uh, I mean. Even even moving into the the current situation that we're in um, financially, I, I think the policies we've got should underpin what we need to, to help support people. So if but people are required to work in terms different policy in terms of outcomes, can we be doing a lot better? You've been doing um, well, I mean, part of the reform of property management is to, is, is to provide that capability so that the outcomes can be delivered. But we'll, we'll deliver what's required based on departmental needs over, over the next periods of time. Mm -hmm. What is the, the timetable then for achieving space utilisation targets across the, the civil service estate? Well, we're looking at the reform of property management project is intended around the 2017. So the idea is that we'll have all the, the, the different offices transferred in and the surplus land transferred into to DFP at that stage. And that during that period, we'll, we'll start to realise benefits and savings from that. So by 2017, if I recall correctly, about 60% of the opportunity is there to, to basically close down inefficient leases or to shut off leases and to move into to more efficient accommodation? And then between 2017 and 2022, about the remaining 40, let just less than 40 per cent of, of leases can be looked at over that period. So there's, there's quite a big opportunity leading up to 2017, and then it starts to tail off a little bit. So that be correct. Yeah. And what, what are the potential savings? Well, again, the, the, the asset management strategy talked of anywhere you know, from 30 to 50 million, but that, that, I'm, I'm always hesitant to give those numbers out, but they're, they're on the record. That would be on the basis of closing down every lease, mm -hmm. um, which may not be, be possible because there may be some you know, pent up demand that we have to consider. So there, there certainly is a potential for, for 30 to 50 million of, of cumulative savings. And so far, I mean, if you take the period 2009 to 2014, um, we've already delivered about 15 million pounds worth of savings through, you know, if you like, the predecessor to this this more detailed programme. Okay, members, is that? Yeah, I, I get the feeling it's a process, you know, and, and there's little urgency in it. Uh, I remember not all that long ago the policy was to actually um, sell off properties and lease back so that maintenance costs, refurbishment costs, be made by the landlord. Obviously, that's changed now, and indeed, we've been buying properties, buying out leases. Um, how do you see all this working through this you know, track that you have planned up to 20, 2017 or 2022? Will, will departments still be able to sell off redundant properties the buy out leases? The idea is that departments won't be able to do anything. We're moving them all into a central unit so that they're centrally managed, controlled, and, and, and if you like, looked at in that way. So we're trying to take away the fragmented um, approach that exists today so that we've got a more consistent approach. So it means that we can target it um, from a central perspective to really understand the, the wider opportunities that are there. So would you be actually driving it then and saying, look, guys, this is not, you should be doing this for here and not for there? Effectively, yes. We're, we're working with our departments to, to, to do that, yes. I always like that phraseology, working with them. You know. 
preparatory work and all those sort of things, but you'll actually be driving it. We're trying. I mean, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm the SRO for the project, so ultimately I'm responsible for trying to get the savings. Your head's on the so block, then. Okay. <laughs> okay, members, any other questions? Uh, just in terms of paragraph nine of the briefing paper, um, it states the objective is to source asset-related opportunities where capital can be invested to reduce ongoing revenue costs, such as rental charges. Does does that indicate indicate a shift away from renting government office accommodation to purchase? Yes, yeah, so, I mean it's very much the opposite <laughs> yeah. of what uh, what Leslie was just saying there. I mean, that yeah. in the past it was very much let's sell off and lease back. Oh, yeah, now yeah. we're saying mm -hmm. let's close down the leases and let's purchase, and, and uh -huh. it's a good time to do that as well. I mean, that's a, it's still a reasonably depressed market, so there's opportunity for us to get uh, much more efficiency by moving towards a freehold estate and moving away from a leasehold estate. So mm -hmm. that's a very clear part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the work programme plan referred to in paragraph 12, is that something the committee can provide a copy of? Um, yes, absolutely. Okay, members, have enough. Thank you. All right, Paul, Jim, thanks okay. very much. Cheers. Thank you. We've now members to a uh, briefing from Assembly Research on renewable energy and public sector buildings. Uh, this is at your table papers. They've set up a department to do what departments should have been doing. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> another director. I'm trying to talk to you. <laughs> okay, members, can I welcome to the meeting Aidan Ste Stennett uh, from the research department. Thank you, Aidan, for your, for your patience. Um, can you give us maybe a overview of the research paper and then we'll go to Q&A? Yeah, no problem, Chair. Thanks very much. Um, the, the paper looks at two things really. It looks a bit at uh, DFP's policy in developing renewable energy and secondly provides some information on what a number of European member states are doing in the same area. Uh, the Department's Office of State Energy Efficiency and Carbon Reduction Plan sets out steps to reduce energy and carbon on the Office of State. Now, the Office of State is uh, defined as 196 buildings across Northern Ireland which consume about 4% of the public sector's energy usage. Um, the steps outlined in the plan aim to save around 10.2% uh, of energy consumption between 2011-12 and 13-14. This is to be achieved by reducing the Office of State footprint, uh, that has given up 11 buildings, um, capital investments in energy efficiency and behavioural, behavioural change in staff brought through metering, targeting and information. Um, renewable energy features in the plan under capital investments. Uh, it envisages eight low or zero carbon pilot projects, that's PV, solar thermal and geothermal, um, to be uh, put in place over the three year lifetime of the plan. Estimated savings would be 41,000 kilowatt hours of traditionally traditional energy usage per year. So that's a displacement of energy usage rather than a reduction. Um, the plan makes clear, however, that uh, further installation of renewable energy usage would only take place mm -hmm. should uh, more capital become available. In evidence to the, this committee uh, earlier this year, the department's officials stated that renewable energy sources such as biomass, solar thermal, photovoltaic and PV are, are not particularly suited to the Office of State environment because they're not cost effective solutions. Um, there's, in their assessment they noted that payback periods were particularly prohibitive. They cited a 50 year payback period for PV and 100 years for solar thermal. Um, commenting on the overall impact of the Office of State Energy Plan in May, uh, officials noted that whilst the final assessment had not been produced, they were reasonably confident of, of achieving the 10% reduction in consumption. Uh, a second significant area of DFP work mm -hmm. is their uh, public sector energy campaign, through which they um, have a monitoring role. Uh, so they, they, they look at the energy usage of the wider public sector, so it's 
In this case, it's 3,100 individual buildings covering the 12 departments, associated bodies, health trusts, education estates, non-departmental bodies and district councils. There's a range of data uh, in this publication for the financial years 09, 10, 10, 11, 11, 12. Uh, overall energy consumption has shown a downward trend over this period and there are other positive results. Uh, energy efficiency has improved and carbon emissions have reduced. However, the contribution of low to zero carbon technologies has remained around the 1% mark over the last three years. So it's 0.7 in 0910, 1.33 in 1011, and 1.22 in 11.12. So turning uh, quickly to the uh, European section of the paper, the Renewable Energy Directive uh, states that members, member states must um, play uh, an exemplary role uh, in the installation of renewable energies uh, in, in, the, in their public sector of states. The, the country profiles uh, provided in the paper show the different ways this has been interpreted. Interpreted? Interpreted? Sorry. Um, it's, it's somewhat difficult to do this, firstly because the information available in English is limited, and secondly, and more significantly, there's no central database which allows comparison of uh, performance in, in the area. However, with that in mind, the, the profiles show a range of approaches. Um, Austria uh, has inscribed the exemplary role into their uh, constitutional law. It commits authorities to the widest possible use of renewable energy in the public estate. In the upper Austrian region, um, it's the same has been done at regional level. Uh, building law requires all new or renovated public sector buildings to include solar, th solar thermal or other renewable systems. This has been in place since 2002. Um, in 2008, new regulations required any building over uh, 100 metres squared, whether it be public sector or private sector or whatever, to, to have a, a renewable element to secure a, a, a building permit. This has been accompanied, this regulatory approach has been accompanied by financial inse incentives and advice campaigns in what the, the Austrians call the, the carrot stick and tambourine approach. In Belgium, uh, a public service company called Fidesco uh, has been created and is responsible for delivering and financing energy saving projects in the public sector. Uh, from the literature found, uh, it seems that its work has been limited to, to pilot projects. They've installed 3,200 metres squared of uh, PV panels across six public sector sites um, with an estimated saving of 20,000 euros per year. However, despite being hailed as success, the Fidesco doesn't seem to have any further plans to extend its use of PV panels. Uh, Cyprus is an example of uh, a region where European regional development funding has been used to fund the installation of PV systems across the public sector uh, in schools and in, in military sites. <coughs> um, the, the, the project had a budget of uh, over 5 million, of which European funding uh, contributed uh, 3 million. Finland is an example of uh, a voluntary approach where uh, different institutions enter into energy efficient agreements. Uh, the municipal version of these agreements require that uh, municipalities monitor their energy use and set targets for improving efficiency uh, and implement measures to achieve these improvements. Um, with, in return, the Ministry of Employment subsidised energy audits uh, and efficiency measures. Um, there's limited data available on the, the current tranche of these agreements. Um, however, evidence from the previous tranche, which ran from 97 to 2007, is mixed, particularly when it comes to the municipal sector, uh, whose savings contributed little, 1.3%, uh, 1.03% of the overall energy saving. Um, and perhaps reflecting this, uh, Finland, is, Finland seems to be moving away from the voluntary approach and has uh, committed to incorporating Minimum, re minimum requirements for renewable energy in buildings into law by the end of this year. So 
there's that's just a few examples of the approaches taken. Um, uh, However, the, the main the main problem with this, as I mentioned earlier, is the lack of robust data uh, on it. So I'm happy to take any questions, but given that, I'd be happy to uh, listen to any suggestions the committee might have of pursuing this this in a different from a different angle. Mm -hmm. so. Again, in just in terms of your, there's mention of European funding, and Cyprus had uh, drawn down some of that for photovoltaic systems. Um, is there opportunities there um, for sales to, to exploit in terms of renewable funding at the European level that the government here should be using? Um, I have done work on the, 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 the regional development fund before, but it, it's a while ago, so it isn't, it isn't fresh in my head, but I can, I can take that out and uh, look at it again and update it and, mm -hmm. and share it with the committee. Okay. Is it? Thanks very much. That was very interesting. The, the whole basis, though, really, has been, and I guess still is, and this is the question, um, do departments still believe that the use of alternative energy has got to be justified on, on a payback basis? From, from what DFB said to this committee, it, it seems that they do. Well, the finance and personnel do. It's just there's so many reports now which show that the payback is pathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree with that? It, it, I haven't seen the, the, the figures that uh, were used to, to work out those 50-year and 100-year payback, though I have requested them. Um, they seem at odds of what I've seen from uh, Quotes and claims from the from the domestic sector, so it's it's something I, I'm, I'm actively pursuing and trying to find out. Uh, it's interesting it. because on the domestic sector, um, as the demand for electricity falls by people using you know efficient means or whatever or switching things off, probably uh, it actually puts higher costs back onto them because um, you know the guaranteed sort of profit that. Put them in. The uh, undertaker allowed to have. So as the sales go down, the price goes up anyway. Seems to be a peculiar situation. I think, in theory, the the incentives are supposed to go down in, in line with, yeah. with the with prices of renewables. I find your report interesting. The, the, the only thing, and it's, it's um, mm -hmm. been the case now for a long time, that there seems to be very little real effort put into geothermal energy. Have you find that? I mean, there's this talk there of some, but I take it they're probably just heat pumps, are they? I presume so. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the penetration of renewable energy is in in Northern Ireland as a whole, but... Uh, there's a lot of hot stuff down there. All you have to do is go down to it. Sure, I can, I can, I can try to find a figure for that for you, if you uh, like. It's a thing I have, an interest I have. Um, they're quite interesting figures you know, for all over Europe. Indeed, I've been to some plants that actually do use it. Uh, you know, for district housing schemes and all sorts of, you know, very useful things, but uh, we really haven't uh, taken it on board here. We're still struggling with uh, even looking for, you know, shale gas, oil. So it's getting another asset that, uh, you know, should have a direct effect. And now I'm starting to dig in my own garden just to see if I'm going to <laughs> so, so far, nothing. <laughs> Thanks. He likes to come with Dean, like Jed Clappard. Do you remember that? You're older than you look. No, this, this makes a good point. I mean, we've a, we've a lot of hot stuff in Ballerina as well that we can't <laughs> make it. So. Um, and that's something that, that you find. I mean, geothermal is something that you know we believe locally could be exploited by the, the housing executive uh, to heat homes, and obviously there's a lot of. Uh, public sector buildings and Ballymun could have been to that as well. So, uh, in many ways, you know, there's a lot of focus on likes of gas to the detriment. I feel personally in terms of uh, developing renewables, and especially at a time now um, where solar seems to be taken off domestically. There's a lot of people in my constituency are getting a lot of companies come to the door wanting solar panels to be fitted, um, and we're sharing their applications out for over 100 acres of solar panels to, to feed into the system. So all of this is happening 
and domestic sector and in the private sector, but in terms of public sector renewables, it doesn't seem to have gone beyond the wind turbine at Dr. Mary Hospital, as far as I can see. You know, so why why is there that reluctance to, to mainstream renewal? From the office's data point of view, it seems to be a, a, a cost cost issue, and uh, the, the, the conclusion that uh, the renewables that they've tested aren't suitable for the office estate environment. Mm. Um, again, I'd, uh, it, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the working out on that, uh -huh. but um, I haven't seen it yet. So. Mm. <laughs> it's definitely something I think we should be worth, be worth digging further into, in terms of the department. Um, Thanks very much, Hayden. No problem. Excellent paper. Um, can we be agreed then to send the research paper to the department and also ask them to address some of the points raised by members? Yeah. Okay, moving on to correspondence. Okay. Sure, there's three items of correspondence. The first item, page 50 of the tax, is um, correspondence from the department, just giving an update on addressing the equal pay grievances in terms of uh, civil service leavers or retirees. Um, that's really for noting, um, unless members have any queries. The next piece of correspondence is from the OFMDFM Committee to DFP regarding the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsperson's Bill, so that's again for noting. Correspondence at page 68, just if members would take a look at that for a moment. Um, it's from Men's Aid Association, NI, and the, the, they've um, issues in relation to family law reform and proposed amendment um, to do mm. that. So it's really just to, for members to consider what, if any action, uh, the, the committee wants to take on that. Chair, um, what one approach might be in the first instance to get a written response from the department um, before considering whether to schedule oral briefings from, from the, the group and from the department. And the other, other option would be in, in tandem with that to commission some initial research on the issue, including in terms of the position in other jurisdictions, uh, just to clarify the position a bit more. Chair. Okay, members agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Will we be taking the, an oral hearing from? I think if we get a response from the department first, first and then and consider it at that time. Okay, members. Uh, committee work programme, pages 71 73. Members content to proceed on that basis. Agreed? Yep. Any other business? Okay. Uh, next meeting will be Wednesday, 22nd of October, 10 a.m.